Gandhi is championing of nonviolence, even when facing a violent adversary, has stimulated public reflection and enkindled political action in different forms right across the world. Not least of Gandhi's influence can be seen in the way courageous and visionary political leaders in many other countries, including such luminaries as Martin Luther King in the United States and Nelson Mandela in South Africa, have been inspired by Gandhi's ideas and values. The violence that is endemic in the contemporary world makes the commitment to non-violence particularly challenging and difficult, but it also makes that priority especially important and urgent. However, in this context, it's extremely important to appreciate that non-violence is promoted not only by rejecting and spurning violent courses of action, but also by trying to build societies in which violence would not be cultivated and nurtured as they are often are today. Gandhiji was concerned with the morality of personal behavior, but not just with that, and we would undervalue the wide reach of a political thinking if we try to see nonviolence simply as a code of behavior, as a personal code of behavior, important though such a code is. Consider the general problem of terrorism in the world today. In fighting terrorism, the Gandhian response cannot be seen as taking primarily the form of pleading would-be would be, would be terrorists to desist from doing dastardly things, nor even just the form, again important as it is, of dialogue and public interaction in peaceful ways with potential adversaries. Gandhi's ideas about preventing violence incorporated them, but went far beyond them and involved social institutions and public priorities as well as individual beliefs and commitments. Bearing this in mind and pursuing the general theme of the relevance of Gandhian values outside India, I ask the question, is there something that, say, America or Britain in particular today, can profitably learn from Gandhiji's political analysis. Some of the lessons of the Gandhian approach to violence and terrorism in the world are clear enough. Perhaps the simplest, and one that has been much discussed recently, is the importance of education in cultivating peace rather than promoting discord. The implications include the need to discourage and, if possible, to eliminate altogether schools in which hatred of other communities or other groups of people in general is encouraged and nourished. This applies not only to militant madrasas, but also to other narrowly focused educational establishments connected with different religions and other sectarian approaches, in which a strong sense of a sectarian identity, local without the global, to which Dr. Singhvi was pointing, is promoted, that distances one human being from another on the basis of religion, or ethnicity, or caste, or creed. I come back now to the question of cultivating social values and social identities that generate peace rather than violence even though I admire greatly the way, the way, the imaginative way, post-colonial Britain has, by and large, succeeded in giving cultural freedom to people of different backgrounds and origins resident in that country, I cannot fail to have considerable misgivings about the official move in the United Kingdom towards extension of state-supported faith-based schools. Rather than reducing existing state united state-based schools, actually adding others to them, Muslim schools, Hindu schools, and Sikh schools, to pre-existing Christian ones, can reduce the role of reasoning which the children have the opportunity to cultivate and use at a time when the priority should sensibly be towards broadening the horizon 
of understanding and of choice for the children whose lives lie ahead of them. The limitation imposed on the children is especially acute when the new religious schools give children rather little opportunity to cultivate reason choice, the reason choice, or on the priorities of their lives. They often fail to alert students to the need to decide for themselves how the various components of their identities related respectively to nationality, language, literature, scientific interest, as well as religious and cultural history, should receive attention because they give predetermined priority only to religious ethnicity. This is not to suggest that the problems of bias and the deliberate fostering of a blinkered vision in these new faith-based British schools could be anything as extreme as in, say, the fundamentalist madrasas in Pakistan, which have been the breeding ground of intolerance and violence and often terrorism in that strange part of the world. In a gentle complaint addressed to the British Prime Minister, Gandhiji said at this meeting, I quote from Gandhiji, in most of these reports you will find there is a dissenting opinion, and in most of the cases that dissent unfortunately happens to belong to me, unquote. Those statements certainly did belong only to him, Gandhiji. But the wisdom behind Gandhiji's far-sighted refusal to see a nation as a federation of religions and of communities belongs, I must assert, to the entire world. Perhaps it's fitting, if I may end by observing, that Gandhiji's descending views from the 1931 meeting are preserved in the records located exactly in London. I fear London has need for them now. One does not have to be an Indian chauvinist to make that claim. For Gandhiji and his ideas belong to the world, not just to us in this country.